Hey, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of Local Leaders, the podcast. This is our Link Up Livingston edition, and we have a, a man, you're almost a co host. You've been oh, yeah, here yeah, been several here times. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, Jeff Ard and uh, Long Campaign Road. You're wrapping up right now. Four weeks left? Four, right at four weeks. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Man, man, you've been going and going. Every time I pull up Facebook, uh, I see you at another event, and one thing I want to credit you for right off the bat is you are making yourself available. Very. Uh, I saw you just did, and I'd invite anyone to go check out the Coffee with the Candidates uh, uh, podcast that was done in conjunction with the Livingston Parish News. Uh, I thought you did a great job answering questions at that one, and uh, we're going to cover some of what you talked about there today and just cover some other uh, other interesting information. And I think it was a couple of months ago you did one with me originally. Yes. It's got a ton of yeah. views. So thank you, everyone out there, for watching that. Let me ask you right off the bat, you're running for parish president, which uh, if you don't know that right by now, you've been living under a rock. And uh, you've been a councilman for eight years. Eight, I'm in my eighth year right now. Yeah. How's that been? Uh, it, it, very educational. <laughs> to say the very, least. Very huh? educational. Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, it definitely wasn't, um, everything that I thought it was yeah. when I, when I first ran, you know, cause I, I, I had an uncle that was a police juryman mm -hmm. and, and I kind of still looked at it a little bit in a, as a police jury system. Um, once I got in there and realized a little bit more about how it truly is ran with the parish president and the council and yeah. realizing that, you know, the council is a legislative body. Yeah. You know, we write the laws, but, uh, you know, people do not work under our direction. Yeah. They work under administration's direction, you know. And I yeah. used to, you know, I can remember people calling my uncle and saying, hey, I need my ditch dug. And he'd go walk inside because we didn't have – Cell phones then, he'd right. make a phone call and say, hey, I need y'all to go clean that ditch tomorrow. It doesn't work like that now. No, you no, know? it's a um, lot more to it. A lot more to it. To say the least. And and y'all been working on um, a lot of things in the council. And for those of you that, that maybe follow it or watch on the YouTube uh, channel, it, it, there's so many aspects to being on that council and things that you – that you do from renaming streets to uh, putting putting uh, streets on overlay list, which is is something. But you all the way up to like moratoriums and, and things of that nature, or you know, controlling growth uh, as much as you can from that from that aspect to even uh, you know widening a servitude or or there's so many things you've done in eight years. It's a lot of work. It, it is. It, I mean, sometimes it's you know. We change laws, mm -hmm. and then we have a couple of issues that might say, eh, yeah. maybe we need to back off of that a little bit, or maybe we didn't go quite far enough. And, you know, I mean, you you can't always get it right the first time. That's right. You know, so you just kind of trial and error type thing, and, and you hope you get it right the first time. But yeah. Uh, and sometimes while you're doing this, you, you have some things that slip in that you didn't really want to slip in. but. Yeah. Uh, you have to do it the right way to stop them. Yeah, and you have to work with other members of the council, and Correct. and uh, that's something that's that's very important to keep in mind. Is is you could have the perfect plan and and uh, the best intentions for the parish, but there has to be a majority that sees it that way in order to get anything done. Yeah, and, and look, I've I've talked to a lot of these candidates that's running for these new council seats. Yeah. And I was telling them, be very careful what yeah. you promise, yeah. telling them what you're going to do. Because yeah. if you don't have four other councilmen that agree with what you want to do, it's not happening. That's right. That's right. It, it's a majority rules. And and uh, the biggest difference being between a councilman and, and the administrative side is just that. They administrate what you put into law. Right. Yeah. Um, obviously from a parish president standpoint, you have what they call a veto power and you can veto that. And, but believe it or not, that can then go back to the council and they can override that veto, uh, with a certain amount of votes. Yeah, and, and look, that's one of the things that I've been preaching on the campaign trail is, you know, everybody asks me, are you going to stop development? Yeah. You know, well, look, parish president doesn't have that authority. Yeah, no. 
It, he just does. He cannot stop development. You know, yeah. parish president's job is to make sure that they follow the rules. Yeah. You know, uh, he does have a pro- the power to veto something, but the council can override it. So yeah. ultimately, your power is in your council. That's why you have f- nine people. You need five votes. It's a checks and balance right there, and it keeps the parish from having a dictator it yeah. dictates everything that happens in our parish. That's right. You know, I mean, that's that's why a council system was invented and put into play. Well, and one thing I will say about you that I picked up just from you being on the campaign trail and, and speaking at various places is you're not a dictator. As a matter of fact, uh, a lot of what you say is the total opposite of that. One of the things I know you're a big believer in is is finding the right people and letting them do what they do. And, uh, you know, you're coming into an administration, should you be elected, where uh, some people may stay, some people may go. Uh, but in, in, then it becomes your job to make sure that you have good people around you. And, and that's what you have to do. You have to surround yourself with good people. Yeah. And then you have to let them do their job. Yeah. If I have to stand over their shoulders and see what they're doing, then I didn't make a good hire. Yeah. You know, I, I've got to go find them people that we need in our parish that can help us do the right job. Yeah. Bring the money. Go find this grant money that can help our parish. You know, go go find new technology that can help our parish. You know, I do think we have a great finance lady that does our finances yeah. for the parish. She does an awesome job. Yeah. Um, I believe me and her can work together. I uh, think she's done an awesome she, job, too. Jennifer Myers. 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 Yes. yes. You know, d- yeah. done a good job. I mean, I think there's a lot of them that I, I hope they stay. Uh, but I'm the type of guy that I'm going to walk in day one and say, who's leaving? Yeah. And I, I'm not going to talk people into staying because if you have doubt of working for me, you have doubt. That's right. You yeah, know, that's the last thing you want. Right. I want someone that believes in me so I can believe in them and we can work in a good team environment I agree and with work that. for this parish. When you go in there, let's talk about that for a second. You go in there, it's day one, and uh, boom, you you're – Parish president, what is what is kind of your first goal that you would like to accomplish? Well, I mean, the the first thing is going to be employees. Yeah, I mean, hands down, you 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 got to make sure that all the departments have the personnel they need uh, to continue providing the services for the constituents of this parish. Yeah, you know, so I mean, hands down, that's first, uh, and then it's you know going and working with each department individual. I, I've had always said that what I would like to do is spend a week, two weeks in each department. Yeah. Go work with them. Yeah. Go see what they do on a daily basis. Yeah. Understand how each department works, what they're having to work with, what can we come up with to make it better yeah. to so they can provide better services. Yeah. So it's definitely going to be within the administration itself, working in each of these departments. Sure. Uh, trying to figure all that out. I mean, we got, you know, is, is our equipment outdated? You know, do we need to look into that? Uh, or, you know, I mean, one of the things I would love to see in DPW is put iPads with our supervisors. Yeah. So little that, technology. Little technology. <laughs> you know, and when they, they go out there and do a work order, they can enter it the moment they're finished. Yeah. The constituent gets an email. The administration gets an email, the councilman gets an email, and everybody that's involved knows, hey, this is completed. That would be Taking phenomenal. Care of yeah. You and know? look, my bug my bug guy has an iPad. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, they definitely need to get that and and uh and I think that's something while you're on that subject of technology, it's something that you really bring to the table is is a new kind of like a new vision and a new technology side to yourself that you can it, Yes, you know, it, and you can go back and look at the council. We, we're in the process of rolling into that technology. Yes. You know, we're using iPads. We're using an electronic voting system yep. that we're slowly working towards. Uh, one of the things that I love about it is it does kind of stop most of the councilmen yeah. from just speaking out when they shouldn't speak out. <laughs> I can't say that it stops all of them. Right. Uh, but, you know, there's a request to speak button. Yes. You know, it, it will help meetings run like they're supposed to run. 
That's right. Uh, and it just shows the power of technology. I agree. You know, and I've, I've always said, you know, when I started out in my business, we were handwriting stuff. Yeah. You was probably doing the oh, same yeah. thing. Oh, we yeah. would go order material. We had to handwrite all of it. We did an estimate. We had to handwrite every bit of it. Yeah. And we slowly worked into technology. Yeah. You know, from the more, I mean, it was so new that when they sit a computer on my desk, I had to figure out how to turn it on. Yes. You know, where <laughs> now I can't, I can't even function without a computer. Yeah. I if know. My it. computer goes down. I'm lost. Yeah. You know, and I, I'm that bridge. Yeah. I under still understand old school, but I see the vision of, of new school and new technology. And I think that's perfect. That's a, that's a great marriage because, uh, you know, if, if the new technology were to fail, you know what to do and know if, what to do, but you definitely, everything is leaning towards that. You really need someone in that position that can handle that, understands that grasp the advantages of that. Yeah. Uh, because at the end of the day, it's going to save you a lot of money and, a lot of and money. time. Yeah. Yes. There's no doubt you're at MMR. MMR. I'm what a, do you do for them? I'm a site manager for them. Okay. Uh, I've been at the same, uh, chemical plant for 27 years. Oh, wow. For most of plastics. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I run all of their major projects, yeah. uh, electrical and instrumentation projects. Yeah. Uh, we have their instrument maintenance, uh, we actually have a huge project expansion going on right now. Yeah. We have a little over 200 employees in the plant. Okay. Um, so I get phone calls all day long. Yeah, you, stay you can busy. imagine. <laughs> yes. Uh, you, stay busy. you know, I mean, and, you know, I deal with uh, project management. Yeah. I deal with uh, planning and scheduling. Yeah. Estimating, material ordering, writing contracts, negotiating contracts, policies and procedures. I mean, everything you deal with as a parish as a president. parish president, I yeah. do it on that at that scale. I mean, we I've run from two thousand dollar jobs to twenty million dollar jobs. Yeah, I sometimes will have twenty jobs at one time going on. Yeah, you know, I have a board in my office, and I mean, my supervisors will walk in, and when that board's full, they just drop their head and walk out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because it's like we we can we never can catch up. Well, look, we're in the business of making money. So if that board's full, we're making money. Yeah. If that board's empty, people are going home. Right. Well, and look, it's a skill that that uh, from a parish president standpoint will do nothing but benefit you, especially with the planning and scheduling aspect of that, and the ability to multitask, which yeah. is extremely important in a role as a parish president, I would imagine. You've seen things from a councilman's side. And I'm sure as a councilman, you've sat back and sat in that chair and, and you've thought, I wish administration would do this. Or, you know, they, they could do this better. and Or if I were in that role, maybe I could bring this to the table. What would you say is something uh, that you're going to bring to that administrative side that maybe currently not necessarily missing, but that you have some experience in and you would like to see change. Teamwork. Yeah. Teamwork with the parish president and the council. Makes the dream work it, as they it, say. It, I mean, that's how it should work. Mm -hmm. You know, um as a parish president, I'm going I plan on being very, very accessible. Yeah. Um I will be at council meetings. They yeah. are the most important meeting for our parish. Right. I will be there. Yeah. If I cannot attend, it won't be just somebody named to be there. It will be someone with authority. Yeah. That can make a decision just like me if it's asked of them. Right. You know, and we we're we just lost that teamwork environment in our parish. Mm -hmm. From not just between the parish president and the council, the state reps working with each other, the state reps working with the administration administration working with the council, the council working with state reps, yeah. the working with the senator. Like we just don't have that teamwork environment that we're all working for one goal, which yes. is to make Livingston Parish better. You just nailed it. And, and you know, uh, your state reps and, and senators and all that, they all play a role in Every parish government. Yes. And uh, very important that you have a, a working relationship. But you don't have to play golf with them on the weekends or whatever, but have a working relationship and, and a dialogue that that is professional and 
and uh, it, you'd be amazed at what you can accomplish. And, and, and they're they're working. It's not yeah. like they're not doing their job. It's yeah. just it's what's the old saying? You don't one hand doesn't know what the other hand is doing, mm-hmm. and and it's kind of that feel in our government that yeah. you know we could be at the council fighting for. You know, school impact fees. You know, that's something that's kind of on the table right now. Right. And you could have some state reps that know about $2 million grant out there for schools. Yes. And it's not communicated to us. That's right. You know, or, or we don't have someone going to their office and saying, hey, right now we're talking about schools. Is there any money here that we might be able to get? Yeah. And, you know, that's something that I have said. You know, I definitely will have a liaison with state reps yeah. to work with them on yeah. a day-to-day basis, yeah. be able to bring us back any grant money, any information, anything that can help the parish. That's huge. And, and something that we've talked about uh, early, early on in your, in your candidacy was something that I, I don't know if I call it, I saw a hole in it, but I would have loved to have seen more access to grants. Cause the problem is grants are out there, but you got to dig them up. They don't just yeah. pop in your lap most of the time. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, there are some, some ways of paying for things. And yes, you have to have matches and mm-hmm. a, a $20 million grant is great. But if you don't have the $10 million to get the $20 million grant, it's yeah. worthless. Um, but there's some out there that you may could get your hands on. If you have someone like you say, a liaison, talking with these reps and mm-hmm. and finding these things so shout shout out for a good job uh in thinking about that now one of the concerns that a lot of residents have as of late is uh animal shelters mm-hmm. uh expensive <laughs> very expensive i mean look to to do a true animal shelter right now we yeah. would need about two million dollars yeah to, to get it rolling in the right direction yeah. Um, is that money there? Possible. Yeah. Can we get it every year? I don't know. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, sometimes it's easy to go squeeze and cut this out, cut that out, and yeah, we could come up with it the first year. Yeah. But then the following years might be hard. Right. Um, I, I have a couple of uh, ideas mm-hmm. that I've met with the Humane Society with. I pitched it to them. They liked it. It's ways to generate money for an animal shelter. Yeah. Without raising taxes. Yeah. You know, it's basically like fundraisers. Yeah. You know, to to help our animal shelter. You know, w- one of my ideas would be to raise money uh, to just do spade and neutering clinics with. Yeah. Free spade and neutering. Yeah. You know, uh, there's another idea that would help fun animal control. The money would go to it. You yeah. know, uh, we actually have some new money uh, that's still a little hush hush because we haven't gotten kind of our first round um, that we possibly could use that money to help go into animal shelter. Yeah. Uh, really, we have two, two new sources that's probably fixing to start hitting the budget and will help us out. And, and I'm sure all that will be released next year and, you know, when we finally get that first round of it. Very good. And so it's something that's on your radar and yes. definitely something that uh, that you're looking into and, and trying to get a resolution on. And, you know, there's a lot of other issues out there. One of them, and I want to kind of get into this a little bit, is the moratorium that's kind of been the talk. Uh, as of late, and initially, this there was a moratorium introduced by several councilmen uh, that was a year long deal. Yep. Yeah. Uh, n- that other councilmen didn't think was necessarily fair. There was some issues with that. Let's talk about it a little bit. All right. Well, let's let's do a little timeline on it. Mm-hmm. So uh, last year we had a moratorium. Yeah. While we were rewriting the section 125 which is our building ordinance yeah um so i think we were shut down for about 60 days for that one yeah uh, ordinance committee was working once twice a week i mean we we were, we oh, were yeah. not gonna let it drag around we got after it we went to work we changed everything we could um you know we didn't want to shut our business down too long right we opened it back up uh, we do have a few things that we 
like I said earlier, we have to go back and tweak it. You don't yeah. necessarily get it right the first time. We actually we need a development built under the new code so we can see if it works. Yeah. You know, but uh, in the meantime of that happening, right after we finish that, we get hit with carbon capture. Yeah. We start dealing with carbon capture. The whole time we're trying to implement zoning. Yeah. You know, we're doing what we can to implement zoning. We're trying to hurry up and get zoning because this will help us with all of this stuff. It would have mm. helped us with carbon capture. It would have helped us with development. I mean, yeah. it wouldn't have stopped it. It would just been another tool for us. Sure. You know, boy, there were four of us. We just, as soon as we got our maps, we went through there. We we did what we thought was the right thing to procedure mm -hmm. to make it law. We mm -hmm. put it in place. And then Deer Run comes along. Mm -hmm. um, Deer Run gets in right before. We kind of enacted the moratorium last time, and it become a, a, a legal issue. Yeah. Well, we thought. You know, I mean, I voted for District 5 zoning maps. I knew that it was zone R1 where Deer Run was going, which is one acre lots. Yeah. The problem is, is when it went to federal district judge, they said map wasn't brought in the law properly following state statute. Yeah. So it's unenforceable. Yeah. Null and void. Hmm. Well, to me, we can't win a lawsuit. Right. There, there's no way we can win a lawsuit. Mm -mm. You know, so, I mean, you got a judge signing us, signing something telling us that, which I have it sitting right here. Yeah. You know, um, so we are offered a settlement. The first settlement they give to us, we denied it. We asked for more time so we could study it. Well, I did that. Yeah. You know, I, we're going to study it. Okay, well, I'm going to take it home and I'm going to study it. Yeah, you're going to read it. You know, um, <laughs> so when we were offered the the next settlement, because there was a few more issues that happened with judge and filed another motion, and uh, the judge finally just come out and said, uh, we don't have a dog in the hunt, yeah. and they were not going to allow their courtroom to be used for political grandstanding. Yeah. So Good for just them. finally said we had enough of it. Yeah. You know, well, when the settlement comes to us, there was a lot of good things that come out of the settlement. Um, everybody preaches about the fourth entrance. I mean, look, it's just a fourth entrance to me. I don't see where that's that big of a deal. But, yeah. you know, if it was going out on another road, you know, and you could make the traffic go in different directions, I would see it being a big deal. But, I mean, fourth entrance is one of them. 600 acres along the river, I'm sorry, 1,200 acres along the river, two 600-acre tracks cannot be touched. Yeah. That's that's going to be stay just like it is. Uh, they originally had a bunch of apartments mm -hmm. in the in the center of it. They changed that to townhomes. I think, I don't remember what the number, but it was all, I know it was less than half. It yeah. dropped from apartments to townhomes, and the townhomes are going to be sold, not rented. They also had to follow our new ordinances, so they were going to do the 20% reduction on the drainage. Huge. You know, f all of that stuff. So I'm, I'm... So they're not only not... Not only are they not changing it, they're improving. Improving it. Yeah. Improving it. So, and then there was a, the same developer is also the one doing the Valair subdivision that was down in the French Solomon area. Mm-hmm. A part of the settlement, and I'll give credit to Mr. Gerald McMorris. It was approved for like six over six hundred homes. Yeah, approved. Yeah, they were ready to start building. Yeah, Mr. McMorris went to the table for them. Said, "Hey, I want you to cut this down to one hundred and twenty-five. I want two acre lots. Yeah, minimum." They agreed to it. Wow. So I feel like. He stepped up for his people and said, That's you know, hey, I'm going to get the best deal I can for the people that I represent. Mm -hmm. and, and he and he did that. You know, and some people don't agree with it, you know, but I'm looking at it as a whole. Yeah. You know, with what all we got from Deer Run, you knock Valair down, which is going to – it that helps the school system. It's not in many homes. You yeah. know, that helps everything that it would have impacted. Right. You know, it helps traffic. That's less cars on the road. So, to me, that French Solomon area 
And it'll bring some industry out there just with right. the people that are coming. The people that's coming. So I, I felt tax like dollars. Council McMorris, McMorris made a good deal for the people down there. Yeah. Um, you know, Deer Run seemed to be – it. it could have been way worse. You know, I mean, that's 1,200 acres that could have possibly been developed. Right. That's not being developed. Right. You know, uh, they didn't have to do 20% reduction. Yeah. You know, so the people below it would have – flooded worse than what they are. You know, there, there's a lot of things that came of it that was good. So we agree five of us voted on that settlement. Right. We vote on it. The same night, the moratorium that the, that four councilmen were proposing was on the table. It originally started off as a two-year moratorium. that got dropped down to a one-year moratorium. Yeah. And it was on everything, 50 lots, and above our 100 acres or bigger. Yeah. <clears throat> the problem is, is in the settlement, there's a clause that reads, if you vote to, to accept the settlement, you could not vote for a moratorium that could be imposed on Deer Run or you would personally be in breach of contract. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. McMorris didn't know about it. He mm. voted for the moratorium. Yeah. And it got him in some trouble. Yeah. You know, now he's gotten out of it. He's done the right thing. He handled it. That's a discussion for him. I don't want to get in his business, but that's where we're at. Yeah. You know, that's what got us kind of back and forth on it. I, I knew it was there, you know, because I had read the original agreement. So when they brought the new proposal to us, I only had to read like a page. Right. Because I already knew what the other sell rest of it said. So yeah. I just wanted to know what all the new stuff was. So I, right. I knew that was in there. And I, I went to Mr. Villavaso, which is the professional that we hired. Yeah. And I said, hey, we need, we need another moratorium. We need one that can stop this development. But it won't, it won't, it can't be imposed on deer run because of this contract, mm -hmm. but, but we can still stop all the new stuff. Yeah. Let's, let's do something to stop that. Uh, the one year was a problem. I said, let's go to the second meeting of the new council. Let them get in there and get their feet wet. And then at the second meeting, they can then make the decision. Do they want to extend the moratorium or our zoning implemented? And we don't need it any longer because yeah. it simply says 160 days are until zoning is implemented. Right. So if they get zoning done next month, moratorium's over with. Right. You know, but that's what we're doing. That's how a moratorium works. You have yeah. to have a reason. Yeah. A reasoning is zoning. Yeah. We need it fixed. Right. We need it implemented. So they might come up the next meeting and say, hey, we need, Bill Abasso might tell me he needs 60 more days. They extend it for 60 days. Yeah. But he has told me that he feels like at that meeting he will be able to give them an exact time. Yeah. You know, hey, I need 60 days. And, I need 30 days. Yeah. yeah. And and from my standpoint and following this closely, I th I think your your uh, your plan was perfect. Um, the issues I have with the original moratorium were the length, number one, um, I didn't look. If you need a year to get that stuff straight, to me, that's that that's an issue with the council. If it takes you a year, okay. Mm -hmm. So um, I, don't, I hope that didn't insult anybody out there. But if it takes you a year to get that stuff resolved, you probably don't need to be on the council. Yeah, that's my opinion. Um, 160 days also fit because you have a new council coming in mm -hmm. and, um, that new council, for example, your seat will be empty. Um, whoever fills your seat, they may or may not want to proceed the same way you did. Well, you're forcing that on them if you, yes. if you do it the other way. So, uh, I commend you for coming up with that, working with the planner, which is the person who's the professional in that yes, and making it happen. Um, you know, it's important. That is the hardest thing from a council standpoint, in my opinion, and you probably agree, is how do you control growth without overgrowing to the point that 
uh, it's just haywire out there with with this traffic. You're always probably going to be a little behind on infrastructure versus growth. Um, and look, it's, it's we, we've, hard. we've been behind on infrastructure for thirty years. Yeah. Way years. before, you know, I mean, way before I ever Randy might have been the only one that was in yeah, politics yeah, back yeah. then. I th- as far as on the council <laughs> right now, yes. Yeah. Mr. Bubble was too. Yeah. You know, but he's no longer with us. But yeah. I mean, look, the subdivisions that we're having problems with right now, there were no rules when they were built. Yeah. They are the ones that were built 30 years ago, yeah. 25 years ago, 20 years ago. We have rules now. Yeah. They're following rules now. Yeah. It's these older subdivisions that are the problems. That's right. I didn't approve one of them. Yeah. I was in the council. You weren't there. I was not there. Yeah. When I came in, it was right away, we need rules. We need rules. And I'll tell you why. I lived on Buddy Ellis. Yeah. And when I lived there, they started building Woodland Crossing in my backyard. Mm-hmm. I have been through it. Yeah. I moved and I ran for a council seat to try and make a difference. I have been where other people are. I know what it's like to feel like this is my forever home, and then all of a sudden you have a subdivision built around you. But if we don't do it legally and do it the proper way, we're going to get sued all the time, and we cannot win. I'm trying to make it to where we do have something to stand on. Yeah. Unfortunately, there's a couple of subdivisions that got through. Yeah. There's always going to be that last one. That's right. That last one that got through. That's you know? right. And I, and you know, and I know you don't want it to be in your backyard. You would rather it in someone else's backyard. We don't. We don't control that. It yeah. just happens to be that's the ones that got through. Yeah. Um, you know, I wish we could stop them. I, I wish we could do more but what it would cost us in legal fees and fighting it and it's we just we can't win yeah we can't win that's right and and uh you know you've said it many times and you know throughout your campaign and that is you're gonna follow the rules and uh and if you follow the rules and you're on the right side of the law you know you're okay you're and, okay, and, and you're a rule follower, you're, and, and that's it. I mean, I've always been like that, yeah. you know. I mean, uh, and it's like I said in my world, you know, we're in the electrical business. Mm. There are rules there to keep people alive so they can go home to their families. That's right. One one mistake by not following the rules can mean your life. Can mean your life, and, uh, you know. And and that's what's trained me of how to think. You yeah. know, I'm responsible for every person that walks through them gates under my direction. Yeah. And if somebody doesn't go home to their family that night, I'm at fault. Yeah. So I preach, follow the rules. Yeah. I don't care whether you agree with them or you don't, you follow the rules. And I'm the same way. That's it. Look, you can't fault. (laughs) That's exactly what you want out of your elected officials. And I want to ask you, you mentioned, uh, also in in your uh, time here in your campaign about a super board and and uh, kind of tell us about that. Yeah, so um, once I, like I said earlier, I didn't know everything when I took office yeah. uh, and I started realizing all these different boards and committees we're over and you appoint to this board and that board and uh, realized that at the time we had five drainage districts. And yeah. we have since combi- combined two of them over on the east side and south e- southwestern part of the parish all into one. Right. You know, so that's called that's District 8. And then we have the uh, one in Watson, one in Walker, and one in Denham. Right. Now, them three are funded. Yeah. They, they have funds, which means two-thirds of our parish is unfunded. Right. Yeah. Let's say that again. Two-thirds, two-thirds. of our parish <laughs> is unfunded. Uh, and we got to fix that. Yes. You know, we – To do that, we need to go talk to the people over there and figure out what do they believe is affordable? Mm -hmm. What do they believe is the right thing to do? And we do that by showing them a plan. Yeah. This is what we're going to do. Yeah. This is how we will fix it with you helping us. You know, because I look, I've seen where they go out and try to clean a canal out and they could have fixed it easily by just talking to the guy that lives there. Right. You know, and and we need to have that communication with our constituents. Yeah. 
But what I noticed is, you know, I have somebody on the, the Walker district, you know, I point two people on that one. And then I have the district eight and I'm realizing neither one of them knows much at all about the other one. And I actually have one on the Watson board too. You know, so with me dealing with three different districts, there's no communication. Yeah. They don't have a clue what, what each one they're doing. Right. So you might have a canal that starts in Watson, goes through Walker, and then ends up in the District 8. Yeah. Well, Walker decides to clean their portion out, which is in the center, in 2024, and it's 2026 before Watson decides to clean the northern part of it out. Yeah. Where if we created this super board, where we have one guy from each district that's on this board, they can have a quarterly meeting just to let each one know what they're working on, what they're fixing to work on. Well, they might realize, well, you know what? Since you're working on Beaver Creek, it starts in Watson and comes through Walker, and then it winds up in the Coyell that goes down in the eight. How about we all work on that canal at the same time? Yeah. And we clean it from top to bottom. Sounds like a great idea. It, it's <laughs> just about communication. Yeah. That's, re- that's all it is. It's communication. I think it's a I think it's a great idea. Uh and communication will go a long way towards solving problems. Yes. Jim, what would you say uh was some of the best advice you've ever got on leadership? I, I probably would say just being accessible. Yeah. You know, being yeah. accessible to the people that work under your direction and to the people you're working for. Yeah. You know, as a leader, you're you're that bridge. You are. You're that bridge between the workers and the people you're doing the work for. Right. And 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 I've kind of always, I mean, look, you can ask the guys that work for me at the plant. Very seldom do you see my door shut. Yeah. You know, they come in. I have a big open area where they come in right outside my office and they have their lunch breaks. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and my door's always open. I can be sitting in my desk and talking to them while they're out there. They, you know, or they could just walk up there and ask me a question. You know, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm like that. Um, I, I, I just make sure I'm accessible to everybody that, that I'm in that leadership role for. Yeah. You know, so I, I try to make sure that, you know, you, you need to see that in me. That, yeah. That I am that guy that you can just come up and talk to. I would agree with that. And, and something that, you know, you've made a commitment several times in your campaign about uh, you're going to be at council meetings and you're going to be involved. And if you can't personally be there, you're going to have someone who can make a decision, be there. Um, And that is also a form of leadership. It's, you know, and it's also, you need to be informed of what those guys are doing at all times. And, and, and uh, and I'll, I'll even say, you know, me and you, the last podcast talked about this, that, you know, look, I'm the type of guy. I want to be the best. Mm -hmm. Whatever I do, I, my goal is be better than whoever was there before me. Yep. You know, so whatever the standards are, the people think is was the best parish president we had, I'm going to leave office being better. There you go. You know, they set the bar. I know where I need to go, and I'm yeah. going to make sure I'm better. Yeah. You know, and I've always been like that in life. You know, yeah. from sports in high school to wanting to be the best athlete on the field, Yeah. you know, uh, to when I started coaching. You know, I yeah. got into baseball. I wasn't a big baseball player as a kid, but my yeah. son liked baseball, and I went and learned everything I could about baseball so I could coach him. Yeah. You know, we did tournament ball. We won state titles. We won a World Series. Oh, I mean, awesome. anything that somebody told me I could not do because I was from Livingston Parish, yeah. I proved them wrong. Yeah. So, oh, yes, I can. And I'm going to do it with Livingston Parish kids. There you go. You Love know? that. And that's man. what I did. Yeah, it's huge. And, and, uh, you know, let's let's talk for a second about because you didn't always. We said this a little bit in the last uh, podcast, but you didn't always want to be in politics. Like uh, that's something that you kind of morphed into, and yep. and and here you said, "Who would have thought?" And uh, you know, your opponent, just to bring your opponent up for a second, is it has been in politics a long time, and yes. you represent a change. You're you're a change from from that and i think that's an, it's important to mention that you are not in this just for 4 years 
you're in this for the long haul. For the As a matter long of fact, haul. when you and I talked last time, you said, I fully intend to serve as long as the people will let me. Long, long, um, I mean, you know, we have term limits. The sure. longest I can go is three terms, yeah. 12 years. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, and if I was here for 12 years, I'd only be 65 years old. Yeah, still you a know, young guy. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of in what I consider the prime of my career, which kind of is the backside. But that's when you really get the most out of people because they have the knowledge at that point to really give you what you're paying for. Yeah. You know, and that's where I'm at with what I've learned in my industry and my years of just going out there and hustling, I can bring that to the parish. Well, it's it, and it's hard, Jeff, to implement a vision in four years. It, very hard. Very <laughs> I don't hard. even know if it's and, and possible. I, I've even um, told people this. You know, I feel like getting reelected the first time should be easy for mm, anyone. Yeah. Because you've had four years to start making changes, showing people that you're trying – you're trying to make the difference, yeah. and they see it. Yeah. It's that third term that's yeah. the hard one. Yep. Because that third term, you better have proven that the changes you made are working. Yes. You know, that's so right. That's that's how I've looked at term limits. You know, yeah. that, you know, your first term, you show the changes. The second term, you make them work. Yeah. If you're going to get that third one, it better be working. That's right. If you get that third one, that means the people – are happy and they, they approve of the job you've done because they know that the, you know, that third term is, is it for That's you. It. So the gloves are kind of off and you know, you, the last thing you want is someone in office that uh, can just go haywire and do whatever they want. Cause they have no, they they have no plans to run again. Right. So what does it matter if you don't like what I'm doing? Yep. Uh, you know, short of impeaching me, there's not a whole lot you can do about no, it. No, you and, can't. And yeah. I mean, look, and that, that was kind of one of the things that I kind of didn't like about term limits because mm-hmm. you run into that. You yeah. get to where a guy gets elected for his last term. He can't run anymore. Yeah. He's done. You can't get rid of him. Yeah. I'm going to ride out these last four years. And I'm gone. Yeah. I'm done. Where if we didn't have term limits, they would still have to work for you because they want it again. Yeah. You know, but we have term limits. You know, I voted to put it on the ballot because I think the people had the right to decide that. Well, and, and, and I will say that, you know, by the time you get around to that third term, in my opinion, uh, if you're someone that for eight years have been doing the right thing and, and pushing yourself, you're probably going to push through that last term yes. regardless. And, uh, you know, the, the sad thing for me about term limits is sometimes you lose people you don't want to lose. Yeah. And you can't do anything about it. And, you and know? You know, you know, I hate that. We're fortunate here in Livingston Parish right Absolutely. now. We have a lot of people here. We have a lot of knowledge in our parish. Yeah. You know, we have a lot of businessmen in our parish. There's yeah. a lot of people there to stand up. The issue is there's a lot of them that don't want to deal with it. Yes. You know, and a lot of it has to do with social media. Yes. You know, they don't want to put their families through that. Right. They just don't want to have to, you know, they're worried about it hurting their business. Yeah. And it's causing good people to not stand up and run that mm-hmm. can help our parish. That's exactly right. You know, uh, and then you get these smaller parishes, which I look back to when I was a kid, how Livingston Parish was, and you didn't have many people to choose from. Yeah. You know, and it's been said, you know, we've kind of had the same people running our parish for the past 30, 40 years. Mm-hmm. You know, this this transition that's going on now to the next generation should have happened 15 years ago. Yeah. But we just, we got so used to the same names, the same people. Oh, well, they got it. Yeah. Well, they got it. And, and our generation didn't step up fast enough. Right. You know, and now we are, and we're getting there, and we're trying to take over. Yeah. And really, I think my race is probably the only one that the old generation could still hold on. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, other than that, all are, you know, I mean, look, I love Mr. Rogers Pope to death. He has done yeah. unbelievable work for our parish. Yep. You know, but you know, he's. He's gone. He's he's retiring. He's out. Yeah. You know, so that's one of the older guys that's been doing it forever that, you know, we just we trust him. Yeah. He's been here forever. He's always done what the people wanted. 
a great guy, Mr. Bubba Harris. You know, I mean, he's out. He's done. He's been doing it forever. Yeah. You know, just these last few older guys are still – they're just now kind of giving it up. Right. And it's it's time for us to take over. I agree. You know? I agree. And, and, uh, and you're doing it. And out there working every day, working hard – and that's why we like to put these podcasts out is because we want people to be able to see who who these guys are outside of 10 minutes they get to speak somewhere. Uh, that You know, that's great for the fast, you know, answers to questions, but it's hard to learn who they are. And speaking of that, um, you know, you don't have a lot of spare time, but you have yeah. some. Uh, what do you like to do outside of, you know, MMR and and uh, sitting on the council and doing all this work for the parish? And- well, um, I love to hunt and fish. Yeah. You know, when I can find the time, uh, I, I love to hunt and fish. Yeah. Uh, I have a granddaughter that, you know, sometimes I'm in the swimming pool with her. You know, I'm fortunate that my son has the house next to me. Yeah. And, you know, I get to see my granddaughter a lot. So I, I do that a lot. I mean, look, w- when you see Jeff Ard, if he's got a drink in his hand, it's going to be a water or a Diet Coke. Yeah. It's not going to be a beer or whiskey. Yeah. You know, uh, you're not going to see him in a ballroom on Saturday night because he gets up and goes to church on Sunday mornings at Revival Temple. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I tell this to people all the time. I'm going to work for the people, yeah. but I serve my Lord and Savior. Love it. Them. love it and uh and so what do you like to hunt what's your favorite deer deer, deer is my favorite yeah. and it's mainly because it's an opportunity to me for to sit in peace and quiet I, sure as is. my wife says i love to find a hunting camp where sales service doesn't work yeah you know um uh, and just just be with nature and just sit there and have my time to really just reflect i'm good at fishing yeah but i get too competitive fishing <laughs> you know uh when i start fishing next thing you know i'm looking for a tournament to get in oh, yeah. uh you know i i want people on the boat with me and start yeah. talking smack back and forth <laughs> to each other you know but hunting is definitely my peaceful time i love it man i love it and uh, look appreciate you coming on and and uh you know you get in office and and win this race and you can come back anytime and just give the people an update on what's going on in, in Livingston uh, Parish from your office. And yeah, and just uh, make sure everybody knows uh, September 30th. Yes. Early, early voting starts. Yep. It runs for a week. Uh, yep. You can go to the Dillon Springs Walker Branch right there at Eden Church and vote, yep. or you can go to the tax assessor building by the courthouse and vote. Yep. Uh, and then elections October 14th. And look, October 14th is a busy day for our parish. We have yes. an election. It's going to be the Saturday of the fair. Yes. Uh, I think there's a trade show going on at V Watts that day. Uh Uh-oh. So there's a lot of stuff going to be happening in our parish on October 14th. So if you can early vote, do it. Go early vote. (laughs) I agree. I agree. And I know some people out there, they have that tradition. They, you know, we vote on election day and that, and that's fine because those people typically going to vote no matter what. But if you have any, any sort of hesitation, just, just vote early. Look, there's no pressure. You go to the library whenever you want during opening hours and they'll let you vote. And, uh, and, there's rarely any line because it's yeah, going to be a yeah, big election it is. Big season election. this year and and uh winding down we wish you all the luck uh please comment if uh if you got any questions and i'll make sure i get them to jeff so just comment on the podcast and and uh what maybe we'll get him to answer some of those questions and i appreciate you coming on as right. always thank you for having me. until next time i'm jim chapman reminding you love your community support local business keep leading thank you very much